Welcome to the Six Gun Interview uh, Hangout on Air, brought to you by the Savage Bloggers Network. I'm Christian Serrano. And I'm Ron Blessing. Tonight we're going to be interviewing the creators of the Six Gun comic and the, uh, the Savage Worlds RPG associated with it. Uh, we're going to cover the history of the comic and the process of how it became a Savage Worlds setting. And, of course, the current Kickstarter campaign and maybe touch a bit on the future of the Six Gun as well. That's right, and uh, honoring us, honor, excuse me, honoring us tonight, uh, we've got writer Colin Bunn. Uh, and we've hey, got, everybody. We've got artist Brian Hurt. Hi, glad to be here. RPG author Scott Woodard. Happy to be here, guys. And, of course, that guy, the Savage Worlds rules guru and Savage Worlds core rules brand manager, Clint Black. Thank you, Christian. <laughs> media, dar media darling, Chris uh, Clint Black is, is, uh, is what it right. is. That's right. So first, I want to thank everybody for being able to make it tonight. This is uh, really exciting. I'm really happy that you, that you were all able to make it, and uh, I think this is going to be a fun time. And um, yeah. So um, what do you say, we guys go ahead and get started? Sounds Let's good. do it. Let's awesome. do it. Yeah. All right, so I'd like to kind of start from the beginning and going back to the comic because obviously that's where all this started with. How did you guys come up with the concept of the Six Gun? This is a really cool Weird West setting, and there's a lot of really rich story and history behind it. How, how did it come to be? What was the origin of that? Well, you know, uh, I've always loved Weird Westerns. I mean, uh, years ago, the very first piece of prose fiction I sold was a Weird Western story. Uh, and uh, it's 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 a genre I've, I've wanted to return to again and again. And uh, Brian and I had been working on a comic uh, previously called The Damned, which was a, a sort of a 1930s uh, mob story with demons. And uh, and I knew that you know I wanted to do something with Brian again. Um, uh, so I started put, noodling with these ideas for. Uh, originally it was even it wasn't even a western, uh, but I couldn't get the story to work right. The story of this cursed gun. Um, and then finally, I, I landed on this idea of turning it into a western, uh, and 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 kind of following, uh, following my passion for that set, that kind of setting. Uh, and uh, initially, Brian was actually working on other projects. I don't, I mean, he wasn't really uh, attached to it in the beginning. Uh, but then, when our publisher, Only Press, uh, accepted it, they they asked me what I thought about Brian, you know, uh, being involved in it, and I. Uh, <laughs> What was that? <laughs> I thought you meant they asked me what you thought about me personally. No, well, they know what I think of you personally. <laughs> um, but, uh, so, um, they asked what I thought about Brian being involved, and, and, and I couldn't have been happier with the idea. I, I think I, when they asked, I said, that's great, but I don't think Brian will do it. Um, and, but, you know, he, uh, he came on board. Uh, initially, the story was – I originally envisioned The Sixth Gun as being this very dark horror story and very limited in scope. I mean, it was going to only be a, a six-issue story, and that was going to be it. Um, after Brian came on, the, the two of us tend to do a lot of uh, world building, and, and, and we once we start talking about story ideas, we can't really uh, – It would stop scatter it off. off. Yeah, and and it just blew out into this much. I mean, it's a very different uh, type of book, uh, and uh, it's it's a much more epic uh, story. It's I, I, it's definitely more fantasy than horror now than than, than the horror I originally envisioned it being. Um, there's still some horror elements, but it's it's much more a, a, of an epic fantasy story. Um, and and you know we've been working on it. Our I guess we're working on the 48th issue right now. Yeah. Oh. Wow. So, you know, I have to ask this, and it's it's a topic I've discussed with people before. I'd love your take on it. Um, when you're doing a horror story, to me, it seems like it's tough to keep it horror when you when you continue to go on and on. It's almost like you get used to the horror, and it kind of becomes, you know, action, adventure, fantasy, whatever you want to call it. Um, did you find in your process, that, that 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 was a natural progression, or um, did you did you make the decision to, to go more fantasy? You know, I, I I think I agree with you. I think if it if if I'd set out to tell a, a horror story for forty you know for fifty issues, it would have naturally kind of moved outside of a you know away from horror anyway. But I think once you know once we got going on the series, we had already determined it wasn't straight horror. 
uh, there are a lot of those those horrific elements still left over um, because I think all fantasy has a lot of horror elements in it anyway. Um, and uh, and uh, so we had already decided it was more of a fantasy story, you know, from the beginning. So I didn't really have to worry about it moving away from what the con- I, I think we've done a pretty good job. You know, we knew what the, we wanted the book to be, and I think it's been that from the beginning and, and still is. Cool. And tell me a bit, a little bit about, um, and I guess this is definitely more for Brian. Tell me a little bit about the um, the art, uh, the the style you chose. You know, were you inspired by anything else, or or, or how did you come to the the art style? Well, uh, I mean, as with any art style, it's uh, you know, it's kind of organic and it's been built for years and years. But I definitely I made some uh, some choices when we went to do this series. Uh, we like Cullen said earlier, we had done a book called The Damned, which was pretty much a, a straight up horror noir type storyline, and that uh, for obvious reasons was very heavy and, and dark shadows. And I inked it with a you know with a brush, lots of blacks. Um, I made a conscious decision when working on the six gun. Uh, we knew it was going to be a full color series, and we also knew uh, it was going to be big and epic, and and you know a real four color comic book. And and so I, I opened up the lines more, and um, meaning I didn't, I didn't use as many blacks. I, I kept the, the drawings a little more open, and and uh, you know I also changed my tools. I went to pens from brushes because I wanted a more immediate line. Uh, and to kind of keep it lively and, and, and alive. But uh, other than that, not too many, you know, direct choices and changes with the art style. I mean, the way I draw is the way I draw. <laughs> so I'm kind of limited by that. <laughs> but, yeah, that's uh, yeah, yeah, that's about as far as it went as far as uh, art choices. Cool. Awesome. So, you know, at what point did you guys start realizing you wanted to turn this into an RPG setting? And why, why an RPG setting, I guess? I, I will. You know, I'm. I'm going to defer to Cullen this for the most part. But I'll say, you know, Cullen's a, a gamer at heart anyway, and and everything we do has always been very much about world building. And I don't know. We've never made a conscious decision that we wanted to to try to turn something into an RPG. Everything we've ever done always feels like it would work very well as an RPG, and we've always thought it'd be fun to see our worlds in an RPG setting. But I'll I'll let Cullen. Yeah. Uh... It's like Brian said. I've I've played role playing games since I was since I was in second grade. I think I started <laughs> playing role playing games, and uh, uh, and and I've always loved them. I think they're they're a great way. Of, you know, I love telling stories, uh, and and role playing games just another uh, avenue for for me to do that. Um, I don't know that. I mean, I didn't sit sit down and say, well, we're going to you know create a book that's going to be turned into a role playing game. Uh, we just want to tell a great story, uh, but uh, but at some point along the line, I remember uh, I was at a convention and, and a gamer came up. Uh, it was at a comic shop. He was wearing a Dungeons and Dragons T-shirt, and I remember telling him, uh, "Have you read the Six Gun? Because this is the greatest Dungeons and Dragons comic you have. You know that just happens to be set in the Old West." <laughs> uh, and and yeah, I remember when I was you know when I was really heavy and in, heavy into playing games. Comics were a great source of, of ideas for me because I knew my other gamers weren't reading these comics, weren't reading any comics. So I'd read comics and then I'd just lift storylines, steal everything. And yeah, I'd steal everything and, and just uh, plop it right into my campaign. Um, but uh, but I've always felt that the Six Gun would be a great source of inspiration for uh, for for gamers, whether they were playing a, a, a game in a Western setting or just a straightforward fantasy setting or, or whatever, you know, whatever they were playing, I thought this would have some, there, there'd be some application for gamers that they could, they could actually get something useful out of the book in a, in, as well. Um, and then uh, our editor, Charlie Chu, started, he was attending Gen Con, and, uh, and he really started talking to us uh, pretty heavily about, hey, let's try to turn this into a, into a role-playing game, and and once he kind of once we knew he had interest in it, uh, that kind of sparked our interest, and and there was no looking back. So, how did you get to Savage Worlds? What, what's the, um, how did that evolution occur? I think uh, well, I was at Gen Con a few years ago, and Charlie was. With, this was when Charlie, or our editor Charlie, was going around trying to, you know, introduce the Six Gun to various publishers. And I remember him saying, "Let's talk to Shane 
at Savage Worlds. And and I kind of, if I'm being completely honest, I kind of, like, oh, I'm not sure that's really the, the best option. And my only reason for that was because of Deadlands. And yeah. I thought that Shane might not be interested in the Six Gun because it is so close, you know, th th they're both weird westerns. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, in conversations I've had with Shane since then, I remember he's told me, you know, when, when you guys put the, the Six Gun in my hands, I kind of was hesitant to read it because I was afraid it would be too close to, to, to Deadlands. But uh, we got it into his hands at one of the conventions, and, and he read it, and, and I think he really uh, connected with the material and, and loved it and saw that it was vastly different from, from what he had done with Deadlands um, and just got very excited about it. And, and I feel like, for, for me, Savage Worlds kind of has that great pulpy feel and the action-oriented and very... Uh, very fast-paced feel. Uh, the rules don't uh, don't get in the way of storytelling, and and that's what that was kind of the it, when Charlie and I had sat down and he'd said, you know, what kind of game system would you want? Those were kind of the things I'd I'd said is I wanted something that lended itself to, you know, sort of a swashbuckling feel and 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 heavy, you know, fast-paced, but still gave the players a good opportunity to, you know, create these characters and 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 tell these stories. Well, then, Scott, how'd you get involved? Uh, well, um, it was kind of an interesting thing. I, I actually have to mention uh, just two things. Uh, Cullen, if you go back and look at Cullen's blog going back a few years, uh, Cullen actually did some, uh, you sort of statted up some six-gun things on your own, if I remember correctly. I remember reading that through sounds, some of those. That sounds kind of familiar, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're actually out there, and, and they certainly were inspirational for me when I was working on the book, but uh, but you just certainly have to pay attention to that. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, yeah, I'll go back to uh, how I got involved. Well, what basically wound up happening was last year, um, I live up in the Portland area, and last year uh, there was a, game, a convention called GameStorm, and Shane was actually in town for that, and uh, we got together and just uh, had a, I don't know, we sort of hit it off really well. Now, that's not to say that that was the first time I'd ever met Shane, because actually I had worked for Pinnacle in the past. I edited uh, Deadlands Noir and did some work also on Deadlands Hell on Earth. So we kind of knew each other through that. And I also had a lot of experience working on some other um, licensee products as well for Savage Worlds. Uh, so then Shane and I, as I say, we sort of just hit it off at GameStorm and... Uh, we talked a lot, and a lot of projects were tossed out and ideas, and uh, sort of by the end of it, we realized we were sort of on the same page. And I th and at that time, though, I really didn't, we didn't really talk about the six gun. That was, it was sort of like, I think we were testing the waters to see about my suitability with for writing uh, with Pinnacle. And it was just a short time after that uh, that we started talking about the six gun. And of course, it's funny because you guys were talking about how it seemed like it was a, you know, an odd choice to have Pinnacle do it, but Shane's gone on record with it. He's made a great comment about, you know, well, who else would should do a, uh, a weird Western role-playing game? You know, Pinnacle is the one who's already shown they can do it. And uh, so I think that's how that, that sort of fell into place. And, of course, as soon as Shane asked me and brought it up, uh, I said yes, you know, hands down, I wanted to do it because already Deadlands was my favorite setting of all time. Um, so, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm, that's, that's absolutely clear. I've been enjoying that setting and the, and the game for, for many, many years. So that's sort of how uh, you know, it all it all kicked off. Nice, yeah. I, I got I had the pleasure of meeting Clint at a Dragon Con last year, where he he presented a, a session on Savage Worlds Pinnacle Entertainment and all the things that were coming up. And and Clint, you you spoke a bit about the Six Gun as well and mentioned some of those same stories. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about that or? Yeah, I can. I can confirm what uh, what Scott said <laughs> very, very much. As a matter of fact, I was on the phone with Shane between the point of at Gen Con when we're working at Gen Con and Shane came up to me and said, these guys want us to make another weird Western. What are they thinking? <laughs> <laughs> and then he got on the plane, flew home, and when he flew home, he called me back and he goes, we're making this game. I what read am I thinking? Yeah, he's like, I, I read every He read the entire thing you guys gave him on the flight. By the time he landed, he had realized that concept of, who better? Yeah. I mean, really, who better? And, of course, he fell in love with it, I mean, just on the trip. And he was like, I, you know, we have to do this. I mean, we just have to. Well, and when he told me about it, of course, I, I sat down and started reading it myself. And it, it didn't take more than a couple of issues for me to realize that this was 
a fantastic property. Uh, I mean, it was superbly written, and of course the artwork is fantastic, Brian. Um, <laughs> so there was no question that I certainly wanted to be involved with that project. Yeah, and what Scott said is not just about the writing, but like Cullen and Brian have already said, all the world creation was already there. I mean, it's it's like, well, okay, you guys are handing us something that's pretty much almost already an RPG. Yeah, we're <laughs> going to work on that now. Thank you. <laughs> A lot of the heavy lifting had been done. Thank you, guys. <laughs> So, so that's that's actually a really good segue, sort of the next set of questions I have. In that, you know, you had this this, as you said, Clint, this story, this rich history um, that you can draw upon, which is a significant amount of the work involved in an RPG. What what's the what was that process of saying, okay, let's take this setting and let's make it something that people can create living, breathing characters. And, and play this game with. So, you know, wh what did that process look like as, as you guys began work on it? Well, the one who began work on it is Scott. <laughs> so he started the process. I came in later, so I don't know how he started. Uh, oh, well, obviously that's right. It's Clint's job to come in and ruin the writer's day <laughs> after they've... <laughs> that. It's, there's, this, there's this thing that's been discussed in other circles called the black edit. <laughs> and uh, what happens is the writer writes a whole book, and then Clint sees it and says, wow, you did this wrong, and it's something that's like basically a keystone, and he yanks it out, and the whole book falls apart, and the writer gets to start over. <laughs> oh, man. That is not well, how it happens. At that all. is definitely not how it happens. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating. <laughs> I know for a fact that there are examples of that out there. Uh, right? There are. There are. <laughs> I have no idea what you guys are talking about. But, but Scott, I'm also aware that you played the game for several years before you decided to write a setting. <laughs> that's true, yeah. That's, that's an important piece. <laughs> Um, I mean, the only thing I could really say is that uh, it, it was one of those things where, and it's, and it's fascinating too, because while I started reading through it and taking copious notes, and I still have just piles and piles of notes, I mean, legal pad after legal pad filled with ink, and uh, so I took incredible notes, and then I, I also... I will, I will say that, I'll say at this point, I, only, I think Scott at this point probably knows more about the universe than Cullen or I do. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> no doubt about that. I was reading through the game book today and thinking, oh, that's interesting. Oh, yeah, that was in the book, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I really did try to make sure there was, uh, you know, everything that could be represented was represented. Um, but it was also a neat process, too, because, and I think this is one of the glories of Savage Worlds, that when I started writing it, fortunately, I have a fairly significant library of Savage Worlds books. I'm sure Ron and I probably have a very similar <laughs> sized library. <laughs> so while I was reading it, I was thinking, you know what, that thing is kind of like that one beastie I've seen in such and such a book, or this one mechanic is similar to what showed up in Solomon Cain, or whatever. So I just started pulling all these Savage Worlds books off my shelf that I knew would be helpful uh, for me down the line, and started stacking them up next to me, and when the stack became three or four feet high, um, I was pretty much ready to just start diving in, and that's the glory of Savage Worlds, is that of course, you know, you can have uh, pull a lot of analogs uh, out of these existing products and then you know put a spin on them so it was really really nice to be able to have access to that kind of thing and it certainly helped speed things up in the writing process but uh, so that's how you know diving into it and I think this is how it is with pretty much anybody who's who's converting a setting or writing their own uh, setting you know from scratch is that uh, you begin to, to think about analogs you begin to think about all the stuff that's sort of been done before but then you you put your spin on it but like I said, that's that's what's so great about Savage Worlds. It's so modular and wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I think we're also really fortunate now, too, both from the fan side as well as I'm, I'm sure from the creator side or publisher side, um, that we have this history now of all these Savage Worlds products that we can draw analogs from and get inspiration and and just sort of see how, how is it approached here and you know how can I sort of tweak this to suit my needs or suit this setting. Can you... um? Could you tell us about a, an aha moment that you had, Scott? When an you were, moment. yeah, like when you're working on the setting rules, uh -huh. and you're like, oh uh -huh. yeah, I need to do this. 
Uh, that uh-huh. happened daily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that happened daily. Well, and you know, the the, the like uh, like we were saying earlier that so much of the work was already done. The legwork was done in the sense that we have visuals. We have, uh, you know, just an, an incredible array of characters and monsters and, and then backstory and all this incredible stuff that's just sort of ready to be lifted and dropped into an RPG. Right. Um, some of the aha stuff, which was, I don't want to say necessarily challenging, but certainly stuff that I really enjoyed playing with, was when, we st- when I started to build uh, certain settings, when I was putting together um, towns. And it was great because, thanks to Brian, uh, you had done partial... Names on signs and oh. things like that in certain in certain illustrations. So I was able to sort of deduce what those those places would have been, you know. And sometimes it would be a part of a name. What's yeah. that? I have to go back and look at those now. Yeah, uh, no, everything in there. Line up with with some of your descriptions. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Everything in there, um, for the most part, certainly on Main Street, so to speak, mm-hmm. uh, is is as faithful as I could be to your wow. illustrations. Um, even down to even if it's you know you see one letter like an H, I'll figure out a, a name that would be appropriate for that H or something uh, like that. And of course, it never appears anywhere else in the in the book or anything like that. So that was in a weird way, I guess that you could say that was an aha moment because I really realized I w- I wanted to make sure everything was as faithful as I could possibly make it to the to the source material. And uh, that was like I say, it was. Yeah, it was challenging, but it was also, I just enjoyed doing it so much, and it was so fun when you would revisit a location, and I would flip open and look at a photo, or a photo, and there you go, the, uh, the drawings, I would look at these fantastic drawings, and uh, realize, oh, you know what, now we're looking at the street from another angle, and it looks like that must be a mercantile, or that must be a blacksmith, so let, let me change my map here, and make sure that that is reflected correctly. So the map, uh, certainly of the, the main town there, is pretty much as accurate as you're ever going to get based upon my more, observations. Well, more accurate than... I mean, I was kind of making it up as I went along. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure a lot, yeah, there sure a lot of those buildings secret, don't even gentlemen. correspond. You've turned, oh, you've turned Brian into Google Earth, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> No, the thing is, now Brian's going to be obsessive over it. For every every street he draws, he's going to have to uh, make sure that uh, you know he's detailed. It. <laughs> well, well and, and you know honestly, that he's not every fan out there will be. So yeah, it's, it's one of the it's one of the curses of working in comics. You got so much work to do, and and you really just have to kind of hit the ground running and keep moving. And for me, I'm a little detail oriented. I would love to sit down. And have drawn out maps of every town we go to. Uh, I generally I have a general idea of where certain uh, locations are, and I try to stay true to that. But uh, I had a lot of fun. I was again I was reading through the rule book recently, and and uh, just reading all all of Scott's descriptions of the different places and people who inhabit the town that we never saw. Yeah, that was and, great stuff. Yeah. Oh, thanks. The, the the old guy that inhabits Boot Hill and things. You know, there there were there are a lot of neat little elements that I I really liked uh, what you added in there. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, obviously anything that I was writing, I certainly wanted to sort of feel like it was still, ex- like it exists in your world. Um, right. so oh, we're yeah, they... we're going to steal it and use it in the comics, so. <laughs> That's right. That, that, was, that was one of the hardest parts of getting Scott's manuscript. I could never tell where the comic ended and hymns began. <laughs> it was like, is this in here? And then I go through the comics and I, I'm like, Okay, yes, it's here. Or, how did he find this on this one corner panel page? <laughs> and then I'm like, well, I'm just going to trust the other stuff is there, too, somewhere. You well, know? You know, there I were think, a few. Oh, go ahead, Colin. I was just saying, I think that's kind of the beauty of, of it as a, of, of the Six Gun as a role playing game is that you don't know where the, you know, you don't have to worry about where the comic ends and where the game begin and the game begins because now players are going to be building, building on to, you know, on to what we've already created. And, and that's kind of what excites me the most about it is, okay. is, yeah. You know, I agree, I agree with Cullen, and, and I think, you know, he and I, again, just sort of the nature of the comic book, we were, we were on a track the whole time because we're telling a story, which has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, but he and I both, you know, we can't turn our, our imaginations off, so we're constantly thinking of, oh, what's around that corner? What's over here? And so visually I'm planting seeds there, or Cullen's throwing out little asides. So all that stuff is kind of seeded throughout the throughout the world, um, and that's what's great. Like you said, that's what's great about the RPG is is now anybody can go out and, and explore, you know, around those corners, those places that we didn't have the opportunity to stop and and, and play in. So it's uh, you know I'm I'm excited. I'm not just excited for other people. I'm excited for myself to get to play the game 
I'm looking forward to Cullen running a running a game for us. So. Oh, that is going to be awesome. amazing. I think so we're all wait. looking forward to that. I can't um, wait to kill Brian's character. <laughs> <laughs> over and over again. Oh, wow. That's, That's awesome. awesome. That's Cullen, yeah. Well, Let me try that with six guns so we can just keep shooting him dead, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's good time. So, awesome. so, so talk to us about... Um, talk to us about any compromises that you think you may have had to make or... Um, or that sort of thing where you're like, all right, I'm obviously there's stuff that you fleshed out that hadn't been fleshed out before Scott, but, but were there any compromises that you had to make? And obviously you went farther in some cases. Did you have to, to not do some things? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously one of the, one of the big issues and we've been asked about this and I've been asked about this personally is that at the time, um, the entire story wasn't told. And so we have to be, you know, we had to be realistic about that. Uh, fortunately, you know, Colin and Brian both were uh, offering me insight as, as to where things were going to go. Um, and the nice thing, I suppose, right now is that it isn't all revealed. So, uh, you know, this, their story is still being told. But what we do offer in the book are uh, sort of uh, at least hints of where, where it's going to go. And, of course, in a nice way, I think that leaves it in a weird way up to the, the, the GMs and the players in their own campaigns they can then take what we've already presented and run with it. And maybe their story is not going to end the same way. You know, you never know. But uh, I suppose that was one compromise. And also, just I think you do realize that how far do you go with this, with this universe? I mean, it, it's so beautifully drawn and it's so detailed. And there's mentions throughout of little things that are happening in this corner of the map or, or over here or whatever. Or, and, of course, you also have, I guess over a thousand years of history prior to the events in the book that are sort of hinted at as well. So how far back do you go? Well, you really can't explore that too much. So if, I think what, what wound up happening was really narrowing the focus uh, to the weird Western, the, the Old West setting, uh, and keeping it there. But, you know, who's to say, Clint, will we do more? Will we go back? Who knows? <laughs> Could we do that? This sounds like the same sort of conversation Colin and I have had. <laughs> yeah, many times. Yeah, we we also you know knew we were limited to the story we were telling, but we also knew that there was so much more to explore if we wanted to, and we still may. So it's uh, it's all pretty exciting. And I think I saw something on the Kickstarter comments maybe where uh, there was mention about the RPG and the comic aligning up to as far as uh, uh, issue number fifty was it? Is that correct? Well, issue fifty is the final issue of the of the six gun, the the, the series. So we'll, I mean, it, we're going to be wrapping up the story of the the characters uh, that are in the series that that have been there since issue one. Uh, that doesn't mean we might not do some more uh, stories in the world, but it is going to wrap up the story of those characters. Okay. Neat. So we we got to see stats for the different guns throughout the Kickstarter campaign. Pinnacle Entertainment Group was putting those out. What was the process for creating those like? Was that was that easy to do? Was it like, no-brainer, this is how it's going to be? Or was there a lot of work behind, you know, thinking through how that was going to work? Old uh, I mean, work. <laughs> <laughs> I remember thinking, thank God someone has finally put rules to these guns. Because <laughs> <laughs> you want to use them now. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I mean, there. You know, the. I suppose the again, it's going to go back to how much detail. Um, there, there are variations on what these guns do. They're not just pull the trigger and one thing happens. And that I suppose that was another thing about compromise. You know, what? How how far do we go with these weapons? And I mean, ultimately, they are super super powerful powerful guns. They are they are almost godlike in their abilities, and uh, because they actually bind or bond with the the wielder, that makes it that's a whole another story as well. Um, and there was there's I mean I'm not going to spoil it, but there's a there's a fun thing about that where I remember I came up with some twisted variation of that uh, rule and uh, pitched it to Cullen just to see if it would work. And I remember you wrote back and said something along the lines of. Yeah, I think I think that would work. And it was just sort of that. It was sort of these. It was a strange thing, and, and I don't know if you know what this is, but it has to do with what's the the campaign and no, what lines happen with the guns. I, so. I, I thought I was. I thought my response was a little more excited because I thought it was <laughs> a great, a great yeah. uh, 
a great workaround for some of the some of those things. I got kind of excited about that idea. Oh, there you I, go. I, I, had, I had the exact same reaction. I was like, that is a brilliant workaround. I, yeah. Why didn't we think of that? <laughs> or I, did, did. We? I did. Or did we? I'm I did. pretty sure. I'm pretty I sure I thought about it. it. Oh, of course you did. <laughs> yeah, of course you, did. you were just I, agreeing with it. That's I all. Think, I think I said, Scott, that I thought of that just a few seconds before you did. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was fun too. Um, you know, some of the stuff we were able to do with the, you know, the la the two one sheets that we've like, uh, you know, that we've posted so far, and those have been explorations of of features of two of the guns. And um, uh, the one hand gang, uh, I I really enjoyed that one because that's something that I've been thinking about since you first introduced the the severed hand issue in, you know, in the in the actual comic. Right. And I thought, oh well, I wonder how far would this could go. So that was sort of the neat thing about that. I don't want to spoil that as well. But I, I suppose going back to the original question, how difficult was it to stat the guns? Um, I think it just really came down to listing the abilities of the guns and then trying to figure out how we could convert those into Savage Worlds rules without completely breaking and bending. You know, I guess we did bend, but without completely breaking things. Mm -hmm. And and I, ultimately, I think uh, maybe in, in, to some degree, I would say that you know they're they're pretty damn faithful. But I, I don't know if they are as powerful as they are depicted in the comic. But that's only in the sense that I suppose if they were that powerful, um, you would probably have, you could potentially have a game-changing type of, of, of a weapon. But at least this way, when they fall into a player's hand, should they fall into a player's hand, which is always possible, um, they can still use it and not completely dominate the game uh, with their abilities. So Clint, of course, came up with some nice little restrictions as well. So I think that was a nice collaborative effort. Well, I think one part for me was, and going back to Ron mentioning it, an aha moment, was kind of looking through the comics and seeing how Becky, along the way, gains more and more abilities with using the sixth gun, and suddenly kind of realizing, as we looked at like the different things it had, that it basically correlated to her growth as a character. And suddenly, you know, it kind of struck me as I'm looking at it, it's like, yeah, in Savage Worlds term, basically every time she increases her spirit a die type, she's accessing a new ability of the gun. So when we did the six, suddenly we realize it has exactly kind of that many abilities, and you eventually have the point where Becky opens up all of them, you know, and, and gets at being able to do anything with the gun. But, you know, some of the stuff that's in there, I mean, he talks about not being too overpowering, but there's one power of the gun that if you've got the sixth gun... Where you know you access it, and, you know you, you can ignore like eight points of shooting penalties in Savage Worlds, and ultimately that came out completely out of the uh, the battle with the uh, Knights of Solomon and yeah. things like that, where she just holds the gun and she's just shooting behind her back and up and down, and it didn't matter range whether she was looking <laughs> anything. It's like she's just killing guys left and right, and I'm like. I know how it happens in Savage Worlds. It's like, and we just got to put it in there that, you know, that's when she accessed it and got the ability. But, you know, I looked at it and I went, wow, that is really, really cool. And he's right. That's awesomely powerful. And I'm like, but that's what the gun does. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So that, well, that and that's of... what, that's oh, what ahead, Game Ron. Masters are for. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. They can rein it in if they need to. Yeah. That's right. Now that actually answers another question that we had, in which uh, you know, was there something in particular that fell into place? And it sounds like that's exactly what that was. It was just like this is obvious how this works. So. Oh yeah, right. I mean there was there was quite a bit of that. I think you know when we went through and we were working on the rules, and it's like there were you know so many things that you know he said you know there's stuff that we could pull from, but then you take all that and you kind of put it through the filter of the six gun in the comic in the world. And adapt it so that it merges fine with that, and and everything, and it it enhances that. But ultimately, there were it was so easy mm -hmm. to do some of this stuff. I mean, you know, to figure out because it's so clear from the comics, like how it does, what it's doing, you know, how this kind of works. As you read it, it's not like it's written out for you. These are the abilities of the gun, but you can just see it in the action and in what happens and for each of the guns you know it's it's so very clear and it like i said it it makes it so easy to convert that or just say these are obviously the mechanics you can see it it's the show don't tell you know kind of aspect it was so clear just showing it being done in the comic that it made it so easy to to write up the mechanics 
Yeah, that was something, uh, when I started reading the comic myself, I was, uh, a lot of times when you see things like that in comics, you're, the, the reader is left to try to figure these things out, and you're like, what exactly is this thing doing? And with the comic, from the very first volume, you're just immediately understanding exactly what they do and how they work. Mm -hmm. and, and I love that, because I know exactly what I'm getting out of the story and how powerful these guns are and what exactly the role is in the story itself. So, good job on that, guys. That was awesome. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Yeah. So, um... So, what... Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, well, I, I just wanted to sort of uh, sort of take a sidestep into the artwork. You mentioned that there's this uh, sort of collection of artwork that's already available, obviously, through the comics. Will we be able to... Will we be seeing original art, like new art, for the RPG as well, or is it mostly pulled from this, this library of, of art from the comic itself? Well, the GM screen definitely has the new art from Brian. The that's gorgeous. The whole triptych three-panel yeah. full, you know, thing. That's awesome. But the art in the RPG, I mean, there was nowhere else to go but what Brian had already done. I mean, right. there was no need for anything else. It was done. Yeah, you got and it. It was perfect. You know, <laughs> it's like awesome. So, I mean, we had it. It was there, and it was just a matter of, you know. In a lot of times when we do kind of licenses, it's a question of, well, we need to find a picture that shows us this kind of specific thing. When we're working with the six gun, it's kind of, it became more of a, which of the pictures are we going to right. use that's going to do this? And that was it's awesome. so hard to choose. You know? I know. It's great. I, w I will say, though, uh, you know, uh, the, the most, the, I guess the furthest goal right now on, on the Kickstarter, if, you re if we reach that, uh, the, the 48, um, there will be new art and, and new, uh, even some new comic art that will be involved with that adventure. Fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. And that's not we're, too... I mean, we're, we're, we're literally like right around the corner from Reach It, so it's going to happen. Yeah, oh, I yeah, think, oh, yeah. I think so. I yeah. think so. And that's not to devalue the existing art. The art that you yeah. have is phenomenal, and I think it'll be really exciting to see that art in the RPG as well, because one, it's going to invoke memories as you've, you know, from having read the comics, um, and two, you know, you're seeing a direct sort of mapping, visual mapping to the RPG itself. And well, I and I think, you know, to build off what Brian was saying, one of the things we want to do with uh, any material that comes out, you know, uh, for the game, you know, there are characters and, and plot elements that we want to start introducing in the, uh, in, you know, in the role-playing game, in the, in the role-playing stuff we're putting out that actually have importance to the world of the Six Gun, you know, into the canon of the Six Gun. Uh, so some of these comics Brian mentioned will introduce some characters you haven't seen before that uh, that may only show up when we're doing stuff related to the role playing game. Nice. Well, I, I, yeah, I was gonna say I think I think that's one of the things that most excites Colin and I is, is that even though the series is wrapping up, uh, we can actually go back ourselves and and play in this world some more and and still tell more stories and introduce uh, other other bits of the canon. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and, and in, a, in a new way that's more interactive and, and you know, you know, involves the the fans and the role players. And I'm I don't know, I'm pretty excited about it. I, hey, I have a list. I already have a list of story ideas I want to do. Oh, excellent, awesome. uh, Brian. I was going to ask you. Do you do you remember when um, uh, there, several months back? This was you know when we were just designing the coming up with the idea for the screen. Uh, do you remember getting my list? <laughs> Shane came to me and he said, "What would you like to see on this screen?" And I think I may have listed about 37 things. <laughs> I ignored it. <laughs> you you um, don't, yeah, you yeah, you don't have to. Uh, yeah, I don't need any help in overpacking an image. So I, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I've I've seen some pretty overpacked images in the comics, and they're I, so rich in detail. I you have, you guys I have to go and read the 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 triptych descriptions that uh, Brian did. They're they're fantastic. Um, nice. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm so excited about this. Um, I like Scott. Am a huge Deadlands fan from the beginning. Uh, back when they used the tagline of "It was a spaghetti western with meat," mm -hmm. and uh, and to to see uh, this being in the hands of Pinnacle, um, for some reason, and, and correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm just getting something out of it that's not there. I felt a little bit of a preacher 
Oh, I think but, Ron's freezing up a little bit there. Yep, losing Ron. Speak to my wife. I've been trying to get her. Are you there? Yes. Yes. Are we good now? Yeah. Okay. I, I was going to ask. Um, I, I, I feel a little bit of a preacher influence in the comic when I read it. it, it when I was describing it to my wife, I said, um, to me at least, after having read the first trade, I said, um, it reminds me of like Preacher meets Deadlands. And and she said, oh, <laughs> now she wants to read it. Um, were you a Preacher fan, or, or did that just happen organically on your own? I, I'm just going to assume that when I cut out, you guys just kept saying really nice things about me. Yeah, that's, <laughs> totally. Okay. Pretty much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I uh, I was a preacher fan. I mean, I love I love the book, um, and I've heard uh, you know from other people have said you know that they see a preacher vibe, and uh, we never saw. I it. don't see it. I, I I really I mean, and I'm I'm I, hey, if it gets someone to buy the book and give it a try, yes, it's <laughs> absolutely. Preacher. That's exactly what it is. Oh yeah, it's, it's exactly preacher, like preacher. Dead <laughs> Land, Walking Dead, whatever will get you to buy that book. That's what it is. Guardians um, of the Galaxy. Guardians of the Galaxy. You like that? You're gonna like Six Gun. Right. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but I don't know that. I mean, I don't know that I there were there was ever any conscious. Uh, I didn't draw any conscious inspiration from Preacher. I mean, there might be some things. I mean, there there are definitely books and and comics that I can look to that I can say I drew inspiration, you know, from these books. But uh, Preacher is not one that. That ever that ever popped into my mind as, as something that that I was it, drawing for. Oh, Brian froze up. Oh, no. he he looks like he's my mind either, but I do see the correlation. Uh, what happened? That's the, way, that's the way I like him best. Frozen. <laughs> <laughs> this is the series of stills. Oh, Gosh, am Brian I still, is such a handsome guy. Am I still here? Yeah, yes, you're there. You're there now. I was just saying, I do, I do see the correlation between the two titles, and that they are both uh, sort of road trippy books, mm -hmm. and and they both begin with a a core group of uh, a, a trio, a core group of characters. But then I I think you know Six Gun uh, diverges quite wildly from there, and so does Preacher. So I'm guessing the big influence is uh, Howard the Duck. I can see that collection behind. That's you right. Yeah, Howard the Duck is <laughs> a huge spine in the background there. I was. Howard the Duck inspires everything I do. This is this is Guardians of the Galaxy meets Howard the Duck. If the, so hey, there you if, go. That works. If, if that's what you need out of it, <laughs> Guardians yeah. of the Ghost Town. That, that works. That's right. <laughs> awesome. So, so I wanna I wanna uh, sort of dive into. I, I don't think we've gotten to see a lot of regarding setting rules from through uh, the Kickstarter campaign. Uh, Scott and Clint, can you do you wanna are you able to share Anything to that effect? Do you want to go? Um, legally, I think I'm the most capable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, really, once again, it flowed so well with what we already had that, like, three of the setting rules are straight out of the core. We're just saying these are the ones you're using. Um, born a hero, which you know <laughs> describes you know Becky to a T, obviously. Right. Um, critical failures rules. Where you know you critically fail, you can't spin a bitty. What I think maybe describes Drake to a T, <laughs> you know. And then the last one is the uh, Joker's Wild Rule, you know, where the Joker comes out, all the players get a Benny because there are times when things seem bad, and then things take a turn for the heroes, and you really see that in the Six Gun quite a bit, you know, because they are you know standing up to be heroes. And then the rest of the setting rules really just get into the arcane backgrounds and how they work. And um, again, a lot of that you're seeing, you know, obviously the the they're right there in the books. You can see them of shamanism, sorcery, and voodoo, you know, and uh, and that's you know you get into those, and some of that is going to be kind of like um, Scott said, it's going to be stuff that you've seen because you know we look at what you know either we had the same inspiration or whatever, but it's like. The way they show up in the you know in the comics fits really well with the way we already had mechanics that were out there to to use. And, uh, that's beautiful. So that's I like you know, that because I'm honestly honestly the only 
issue I have with Savage Worlds at this point is there's because of how much is out there, um, particularly on the licensee side, there's been some rules creep. So I'm all about keeping it compact and only having in there what you need to have in there. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's not to say that there aren't uh, some variations, and you know, we do have sure. some edges and hindrances yeah. and things like that, but um, that are you know obviously setting specific. But uh, yeah, I mean, we we really tried to to make it sort of leap right out of the. If you're familiar with the rules, you're having no no problem jumping into it with a, just a couple of little tweaks. And the the other nice thing is because the rules fit so well, and it was so easy just to use off the core, that if you're a fan of the comic who hasn't played an RPG before, it's going to be so easy to pick this up. And, you know, you look at Savage Worlds and you look at the rules that we have in there, and, and it's easy. It's going to be a smooth transition between the two as opposed to, like you said, occasionally, you know, you get into settings where they need more setting rules. They need more to kind of build them. This was easy, you know. This was, you know, little. so it'll be easy for new people to get in, play the game, get going, regardless of your experience, you know, with the system. So when I was reading... Um, the sixth gun. My first thought about setting rules that I thought might be interesting was uh, righteous rage out of Solomon Kane. Um, just because of that, that whole things kind of take a turn for the heroes sometimes. Um, and that whole feel of, well, crap, I'm not going to let this happen, kind of situation um, that seems to, to fit with the setting. Mm -hmm. um, would it be a terrible thing to, to add something like that in if it's not in there already? No, it's not going to be terrible to add anything. I mean, if you're already familiar with the system, I mean, you can look at it and see. I mean, like Scott said, that's the thing about Savage Worlds. You can easily, um, you know, take something you want from somewhere else and run it, you know, and into Savage Worlds. It's like going, I want to pull that setting world. That's the way I want to see, you know, um, the uh, the game running, you know, and uh, it's like I want Righteous Rage from Solomon Cain. Okay, you drop it in and you you run with it like that. I mean, it's okay. it's easy to plug and play if that's what you want. Um, now, you know, we looked at it and we were kind of like, well, if they've got a bigger flow of binnies because of Joker's Wild. You know, you, you've kind of got some of that ability there to do that. And, you know, some of the times it's kind of cases of, you know, things get rough, but then things don't always go the right way. I mean, I'm kind of thinking of a certain, you know, train trip the heroes took, you know. <laughs> it didn't go quite as planned, right. you know. You know, so, uh, but I didn't want to make it a case of, well, I can pull Righteous Rage out and make sure we get through this. You know, sometimes... The story is going to go a certain way or not a certain way, but again, if you want to bring it in, you know, it's no problem, you know, because cool. it cleaves close enough to the core that anything like that is easy to drop you know, in there. Yeah, I think uh, just because we had a recent conversation regarding the new shaken recovery rule, and we, you know, relentless was revised to suit it. There was a one part in the comic. I don't want to spoil it for anybody who hasn't read it yet. Where um, they, I saw the relentless edge in my mind being used, where you know somebody had picked up the gun and it's burning them, and they're just still pulling the trigger and using it. And I thought that was so cool. Uh, that was, it was exactly, you know, something I would see out of Savage World, so. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. There, there's still going to be a ton, of, a ton of stuff to go the opposite direction, though, because if you got Savage Worlds and you're picking stuff up, it's like talking about Brian putting so much, you know, filling in his art. That's like one of, you know, one of my favorite parts is when we get to the relic section, and Scott, Mr. Attention to Detail, <laughs> pulled out items from the background of showing, you oh. know, the Knights of Solomon. And we've got stats for some of those relics that were down there, you know, in their vault that mm -hmm. they had. I mean, we actually ended up with some of them had, we had more items than we could fit in the book. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and it was kind of like, okay, Scott, it's good. Can stop now. You know? it's like, it's like we can let them come up with some of their own. That's a good problem to have, though. You know. Yeah. That, well, that was, was one of my that was one of my favorite bits. Uh, oh yeah. 
is again I you know I'm I populate that world with these things and hope and I, in my mind I make up little stories about them or whatever but I hope other people do the same and then getting to read in the rule book my favorite is probably the um, what was it the Iron Maiden of Nuremberg oh yeah I, I really I thought that was <laughs> awesome and and now I want to do a comic with it <laughs> <laughs> well it was in there it was in that drawing I mean what am I supposed it's to in do? the drawing but that's yeah <laughs> that's awesome. That is, I I love hearing that that um, Scott actually created stuff from tidbits in the comics because um, one of the things you worry about with a, a licensed RPG is you don't want to just regurgitate what was in the show or the the book or the comics or whatever, and unfortunately that happens a lot. So it's neat that, uh, and Scott's probably had that same experience that he was trying to avoid as well. So um, I see him nodding there. <laughs> um, so well, and you also to, know, to see that. You also know that the hardcore fans of the comic are going to say, you know, there was that thing in that one panel. I can't believe yeah. you didn't describe it. Now <laughs> this goes way back to what you're saying about compromise. I mean, how when do when do you stop? And as Clint said, yeah. I provided so much that that we had to actually cut some stuff, but. Um, but you know that there's going to be a fan out there who's going to say, you know, there was this one thing in there that I'm really disappointed you didn't put it in the book. But damn, I tried, guys. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did I did I hear the words uh, six gun companion? Was that? Was that what I, heard? No, I didn't. Not from me. Not from me. I'll tell you one thing. That is, you talk about doing a license setting in a licensed RPG. Doing the six gun that has been one of my favorite things. The inherent concept of the six, the whole basic idea lends itself to the idea that you can take your players and run through an entire adventure and basically you know, run a very similar storyline to what goes on and at the end of it you can go back and suddenly now we're back to the story about you know, Drake and Becky. Right. Mm -hmm. Because guess what? You just reset things, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you reset the world to become the next storyline, you know. <laughs> or it could be something like that. It was. Oh, yeah. It's rare that you get something that's within the license setting that gives you that inherent hook to be able to make it your, your own game, however you want to play it, mm -hmm. so easily. And that's just beautiful. So um, are there going to be more um, products like Benny's card deck, stuff like that? Uh, we've already got Benny's on the uh, Kickstarter. They're an add-on. I meant to um, say just card decks, obviously. <laughs> uh, okay, just card decks. You know what I mean, not what I say, Clint. Uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, I don't think we have a plan for a card deck right now. Okay. Um, we have Benny's. Uh, we have the minis that are on the stretch goal. Um, we're already close to the, uh, the, the new uh, story and adventure and everything like that. Um, we've got uh, uh, obviously you know you could look at the Kickstarter we've got the wild die we've mm -hmm. got the die set uh, those kind of things but um, right now other than that and the uh, the core book and the GM screen with the winding way which is essentially your you know mini plot point campaign right there with six adventures ready to go um, that's kind of uh, that's kind of it but you know you unless you're features coming Yes, we got the creature features. I mean, all the yeah. stuff that's on the Kickstarter yeah. that's that's listed out there, um, as of now. You know, when we hit forty-eight thousand, there might be more listed. Oh, <laughs> my wife is looking at me. I cannot speak of this anymore. <laughs> oh, you're getting looked. The CMO. I do it. Everyone says hi, Jody. In trouble. I call that a good interview. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, um, she's also <laughs> reminding me to mention Cullen's game at the uh, at Gen Con, um, because I think uh, one of the things we want to you know kind of give you guys a little advanced preview on is we mentioned that the the people in the Kickstarter are going to get something special if you're a true fan of the Six Gun and you're going to be at Gen Con, and you talk about getting a little something extra. We mentioned there's going to be swag. I mean, you get everything, if you bid, that's at the $350 level. You get all of that stuff already. But in addition, the extra stuff we said, the fans that are there are getting a copy of every Deadlands Reloaded book from Pinnacle 
in physical and PDF form. And uh, I know, Whoa. yeah. <laughs> uh, Oni is also providing a grab bag of comics, as I recall, which is not just Six Gun. It's you know it's different things. Uh, hopefully, you've already got all the Six Gun. You've read those. You know, if not, buy more. Uh, buy two copies. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then the uh, the thing that really excites me, um, which is going to be really special for the people that do it, as far as doing something extra, we're doing an 11 by 17 print of the cover of the first comic wow. that's going to be done, and it is going to be a limited numbered edition just for the Gen Con True Fans of the Six Gun, and they're going to get that. Uh, also as well. So as far as some extra stuff, that's what's going to be in for those true fans of the Six Gun who are there. And also they get to get their characters killed by Cullen. Awesome. <laughs> you can but they probably more. get to see Brian killed first. Right. <laughs> yeah. I've, I have actually been told that I am not allowed to play in that game. That I need to leave room for, uh, for, uh, for the true fans. I'm going to be drawing pictures in the meantime. Uh, <laughs> character portraits. Awesome. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I will be playing in a private session. <laughs> I, think we're pl- I think we're playing a couple. Does that sound dirty? <laughs> it did a little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm going to be killing your character in my private session. <laughs> <laughs> I think that sounds like a euphemism, guys. It That's does. Cool. It does. Oh, man. <laughs> it does. It's going to be let's fun. Just say, let's just say I was incapacitated early and often. <laughs> You can you can edit this, right? No, it's we're live. Live. <laughs> live. I'm not in the context at all. This is I'm not using any bad words. Ron walked out shaken. <laughs> uh, oh, Poor man. Clint. Poor Clint. Do we have so, any? Did any questions pop up? Christian? No, I'm actually quite surprised. I didn't get any emails or uh, yeah. Apparently, people don't like the six gun thing. I guess uh, we covered it. We covered everything. <laughs> yeah, we did it. We got it all. Yeah. So yeah. Um, so the only thing left, as far as like regarding the products and accessories, one I wanted to say that the the art for the GM screen looks fantastic. I that's going to look phenomenal when it's on our tables. And so great work on that. Um, and then I know this isn't slated, but just consider it as an option. An, an adventure deck dedicated for the six gun would be amazing because I think there's so much cool stuff that happens in the six gun as a setting that there's there's probably some at least some promo cards. So just think about that. I'm just throwing that out there, Clint. You know, so, you know, you might be able adventure. to you might be able to take some of the stuff that you ruthlessly edited that Scott created and uh, <laughs> maybe put together a doc. <laughs> just saying, yeah. a relic deck. <laughs> oh yeah. man! Here's every relic that's in the Knights of Solomon's vault. <laughs> that would be All right, awesome. you heard it. You heard it from Clint. That. Clint's creating a relic deck for. Uh, I thought I got seven. almost all of them. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make more. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That's all right. Times. We'll just ask Brian to draw from the other angle so we can see what's on the other side of the okay. room. <laughs> <laughs> so and so's initials carved into the side. You know. That's right. Awesome. So uh, we're we're getting close to the end of the hour here. Are there is there anything else that any of you would like to add that we haven't covered or uh, whatnot? Wow, the interview was that good. Awesome. Yeah, I think I'm good. Well, it was an absolute pleasure to meet you guys. Yeah. Um, Clint, it's always a pleasure. I, I've uh, enjoyed our little online friendship and. <laughs> <laughs> and the, oh, and the, the banter. <laughs> so, Clint, how many days left do we have on the uh, on the Kickstarter? By the way, how many days left do we have? How many days left do we have on the Kickstarter? I think it's ten. ten. Yeah, yeah, it's ten. So, ten days. All right. So, there's plenty my, of time for all of you out there to get in on it if you haven't yet. My yeah, Kickstarter app says ten. <laughs> yeah, and I believe we have three spots left at the table for Gen Con. Uh, Man, I wish I the game. Gen Con. Oh, uh, Ron, you gotta go. You can't I make know. it this year. Oh. I, I, I still have never been to Gen Con. It's, oh, yeah. It's a travesty, is what it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I forgot to mention uh, one of the things about the game um, that's gonna come up is we're we're it's gonna be at a four star restaurant, and 
The players get every, you know, well, everybody except Brian is getting a meal. We'll have him in the corner just drawing. <laughs> um, but it is, uh, it is a, uh, it is going to be an open tap on the beer. <laughs> or Brian just left. How could he leave then? <laughs> he did. He did just uh, text me and say he dropped off again to tell everyone uh, thanks for uh, having. Him. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, he might he might need a few of those. But uh, yeah, it is it is definitely going to be a it's going to be a a major you know. Um, My you games know. only get better the more beer you have. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that that's that's the reason why. That's what we heard. You know? Yeah. I think everything gets better the more beer you have. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you all again for joining us this evening. This was a blast and a lot of fun. Um, absolute pleasure to meet you, Scott and Cullen, and of course, uh, your uh, Brian as well. And um, yeah, I think uh, the Kickstarter has been phenomenal. The success. What? How many hours did it take to fund? It was like two hours, I think, at at, at worst. I thought we had it in the first yeah. hour, didn't in we? In the first hour. Funded within the first hour. Yeah. I remember seeing an announcement that it was live, and then like. I don't even know how much time. Hey, we funded. I was like, <laughs> okay, it's done. Good, cool. So uh, yeah, it's, it's this is pretty amazing. This is probably one of the most, I guess, successful Kickstarters Pinnacle has had. Is that correct? Yeah, it's it's close. I mean, it's it's pretty mind-boggling to us that I mean we're getting ready to uh, pass the stretch goal we have listed. Yeah. Now you know we know where we're going. You know. Uh, past that point, uh, it's just a matter of let's hit it and then let's open those things up. And you know, I think I think the fans are going to be thrilled when they you know they see you know what's planned beyond that. And there's still you know you know plenty of room to get in and, and enjoy it. And I I think you know there's just so much that's already in there and already unlocked. I mean, like Scott said, the creature feature. I mean, getting you know the stats for the um, the great worms. You know. Yeah. Yeah. That kind that's of awesome. stuff will be phenomenal. But. All right. Well, uh, that's it for our show for tonight. Thank you again, everybody. And, uh, of course, we're really looking forward to having the six gun in our hands as an RPG and, uh, yeah, enjoying the comic. And, again, for those of you out there, if you haven't picked up the comic, do so. It's phenomenal. It's absolutely amazing. So, uh, yeah. So, good night. I'm Christian Serrano. Good night, everybody. Ron Blessing. And you guys can say goodnight, too. Or oh, okay. <laughs> Good night for me. Too. Scott Woodard. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, guys. <laughs>